tonight, our last night, as Justin was saying. Thank you for that music. That was wonderful, Justin. Great time of praise and worship before every message. And everybody else here who knows it preaches knows it's great when you can come up after that, right, to preach the Word of God. Appreciate that, that effort and everything. I appreciate you guys. We really love you guys. You guys are so nice to us. You know, and I'm speaking for David and for Nelson and for Jose. Just a blessing. And I'm, I'm just really proud of you guys because they get to know you guys and, and see what you're like and everything. And so it's good when they meet a nice American, you know. There's so many. Uh, actually, the groups that come down are really good people. And so uh, they have a good opinion and everything. There's no ugly Americans who come down. But uh, I really appreciate how you guys are, are just loving to us, have the same heart for missions, have the same heart for reaching people, have the same heart for discipling. We don't have to explain ourselves because we're trying to do the same thing. It's really not that much different. And, and uh, the things that Jose was asking us to pray for, you know, when we were in the coffee shop before him, is the things I know that, you, that is uh, close to your heart also. And so I would just ask you to continue praying for us as we continue trying to reach out. And, you know, my two main concerns is um, in the new normal, I know we overuse some of these terms, but things have changed in the world. And I'm not trying to sound negative, but Jesus did say this was going to happen. And he didn't say it would stop. And so there will be more pestilences. And I think we have to accept that we have to learn how to share the gospel in these moments and how to connect with people and everything. Because um, if we don't, the devil takes advantage of it, you know, and separates us out and we need to be together. And so anyway, pray for that for us also that we'll be able to minister in this, in this new um, reality, in this new ambient. And, and I'm praying that the, the COVID thing completely disappears or what they say, it's going to be endemic next year. And I told someone, people a lot of times will ask me questions about COVID and what do I think where it came from and all that stuff. And I said, the only thing I've learned about COVID is humility because we just don't know. It always cracks me up when an expert gets on there and says, well, the science says, and they're like, they're experts. And um, then they change things. You know, we just don't know. To me, this should be a humbling affair. It should humble us to show this, this little tiny thing can bring human beings to their, to their knees. You know, it shows how great and how powerful God is. And so pray for us as we minister in these times. And also, you know, I know you have the same heart for this, but the thing I'm praying for personally is to reach the next generation. We want to reach the next generation. It's the biggest population of our part of the world, like I said, between 25 and 40 years old. And it's the lowest percentage of um, evangelicals or churchgoers. And um, we're thinking about that as we think about the new leaders in our church, and I know you have the exact, exact same heartbeat, but please be praying for that for us, that we'll continue to reach people. And um, I shared with you last night about our discipleship program, and we, our discipleship program finishes when we think a person is ready to be a leader in the church, and then continues with teaching after that. And so we're praying for more leaders. The harvest is so white. It's unbelievable in our part of the world. We just need more people to lead others to the Lord. You know, Leo said this all the time, um, you guys, some of you know Leo Humphrey and heard about him, but Leo was like my dad, and uh, he, was the, he was the director of our, the ministry that I'm now the director of Good News in Action. And what Vida Nueve is, is a church where I'm a pastor, and so that's kind of the face on the El Salvador side, where we send out Salvadoran missionaries, and the American side is Good News in Action, that's how it works. And, and Leo made a statement when I first went to Central America, he said this, there are more people in the world who want to hear about Jesus than Christians willing to go. And I always thought that was just one of those ridiculous statements that preachers make, you know. But um, you can write it on my tomb. There are more people in our part of the world that want to hear about Jesus than people that are willing to go. We desperately need workers. We desperately need people that want to tell others about Jesus. And if you come on a mission trip and you say, well, I can't speak Spanish, the only requisite is speaking English. And, you know, you have really good English speakers in this part of the country. You know, the Midwestern accent is one of the best accents in the United States. Um, sometimes we have Southerners come down. And one time we had a lady come from Crystal Springs, Mississippi. And one of the interpreters came running to me. And she said, Jonah was not a woman. Jonah was not a woman. She said it to me in Spanish. And I, her name is Sonia. I said, Sonia, what are you talking about? This lady is saying that Jonah was a woman. I said, what are you talking about? Jonah was a woman. So I walked up to the lady from Crystal Springs, Mississippi, and I said, what have you been saying? And she says, well, I've been saying that my testimony is a lot like the woman at the whale. 
And so what she heard was, you know, whale is W-H-A-L-E. She heard the woman and the whale. And so she kept saying, the woman and the whale. Jonah was not a woman. It was a man. And so you guys have good accents. Everyone can understand you. If anybody here is from the South, I'm not trying to offend you or anything. But um, it's just what I'm trying to say is a lot of times people will say, I can't make the trip because I can't speak Spanish. But in our part of the world, people like to hear English. They pay more attention, believe it or not, because they like to hear English. Everyone's trying to learn English. And of course, you do need an interpreter, but we provide the interpreters. So if you're willing to come, I think God will usually be great. You can talk to all the others who have come on mission trips who we're so thankful for. And, uh, you know, part of the reason Jose's here right now is that one time we had a, a, a campaign in front of our church, and uh, Nelson was there in those days, and we only had one girl raise her hand, a little 14-year-old girl. And uh, she raises her hand, and she gets saved. I'm talking about Veronica. And uh, so a girl laid in our church to start a discipler. Found out she had all kinds of problems, this girl. She was going to kill herself. Um, I just found out a few years ago that her sister said she had a gun and was going to kill herself and her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend. And she got saved. And she just totally changed. And so she changed so much that everyone in the family wanted to hear about it. So her cousin got saved. And her cousin um, moved to Fresno, was married to a pastor. Then her other cousin got saved when we went into his neighborhood um, to preach the gospel. And, uh, and, and we did a follow-up on him. And he's now our missionary in Bogota, Colombia. And then he asked his best friend to come to church and share the gospel, and that's Jose. And then uh, her sister got saved, and her sister's husband was the other missionary in San Pedro Sula, who is now in El Salvador. And uh, then her uncle got saved, who's the best Christian I've ever known. I'm talking about Adan. You guys know who Adan was. And they agreed with me. He's now with the Lord. And I could go on and on. I don't want to bore you. What I'm trying to say is that when groups come down, you know, it makes a difference. Anytime you have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, it's worth it. You just don't know what's going to happen. And I believe we're living in the best time in history. I know it sounds corny. I think this is the greatest time in history to be alive. And a lot of people say, well, you know, um, you know it's, it's tough these days. And, and sometimes you're just not in the right place at the right time. And I always tell this to people. If you're a Christian living for the Lord, you're always in the right time at the right place. You remember what Ephesians 2.10 says? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So tomorrow morning, you will be in the right place at the right time if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're living for the Lord. You'll be in the right place. The problem isn't being in the right place at the right time. It's taking advantage of the opportunities. What, what would have happened if Benjamin Franklin didn't want to get wet? Do they still teach that in American history when he flew the kite and the electricity hit the kite? I mean, American history has changed so much. It's just, it's, it, I didn't know. But, you know, one time he flew, what if he didn't want to get wet, Right? What if somebody would have stopped Osama bin Laden when he was just starting out in power? I mean, there are so many what ifs. What if Peter Parker would have stopped the thief who killed his aunt and un killed his uncle? <laughs> Remember Spider-Man? I mean, a lot of the kids say, I don't care about all this dumb history, but Spider-Man, that's important, you know? And so the problem isn't being in the right place at the right time. You're always in the right place at the right time. The problem is not acting at the right time. Napoleon, the, one of the greatest generals of all time, was a master um, with strategy. And he said that in every battle, there was 10 or 15 minutes where the, battle, the, the, went, the end was determined. And you had to take advantage of it. I think that's the way life is, too. Knowing when to act at the right time. The, the Greeks had, used to have a statue that had hair in the front and was bald in the back. It was the opposite of me. And so it, it, had, it had all this hair in the front and the back was bald. And you know what they called that, that statue? opportunity because you got to grab the hair as it's coming because if you don't there's nothing to grab and that's the way life is I think the saddest thing that's going to happen to us is stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in the judgment seat of Christ and see all the missed opportunities and God's saying I prepared all that for you it was all set up for you now I don't want to talk about the past let's talk about tomorrow God has prepared some incredible opportunities now, another thing about this, many times we think that God only uses special people, but these guys here right now, that my favorite group of people in the Bible are the nobodies. I love the nobodies. You guys know that, right? I've preached on every one of the nobodies. Like, who's the hero of the story of Naaman? Does anybody remember the story of Naaman that, that was healed? The hero of the story is Naaman's wife's servant. And what was her name? 
She's a nobody. And, and, and who's the hero of the story of the paralytic man that was dropped through the roof and was healed? Remember what Jesus said? Because of their faith, he healed them. Because of their faith, he healed them. What were their names? They're nobodies. Because God uses nobodies. He just uses people that say, I'm nobody, but it's time to be used by God. And my favorite nobody, I told, I told Brownie that I wanted, I just love this passage. And I've preached this, this book twice. And uh, it's something that the young guys are sharing in our ministry, trying to reach young people. And it's the story of Esther. Esther, we do have her name, but she's the biggest nobody in the Bible. And Esther was probably 15 or 16 years old when she won a beauty contest that she didn't want to enter. And by winning the beauty contest, you guys all know the story, she became the queen of Persia. Well, big deal. And the story that we're going to see tonight, she hadn't even talked to her husband for 30 days. She didn't really win. And here's the thing about Esther. She was orphaned twice. She was orphaned because her parents died, and then her cousin Mordecai adopted her. But when she won the beauty contest, she was separated from her uncle, can you, or from her cousin. Can you imagine being orphaned twice? Can you imagine being 15 or 16 years old and you're all alone? And so this is what happened. Let's go to Esther verse 3. Esther verse 3. Okay, every great story in the Bible, and I always tell this to our young people. Uh, you can tell the young people think I'm weird, but I always tell our young people, I say, the greatest stories are not made in Hollywood. They're in the Bible. Hollywood copies them. I'll give you an example. What does almost every Disney movie have in common at the start? They kill the mom, right? Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Finding Nemo, Bambi, the mom. If you're a mom, don't go to Disney. You're in trouble because <laughs> they're gone. Moms are gone. And, and why do they do that so often? Because it tugs at your heartstrings. Well, that's the story of Esther. I know she lost her dad too. And, and Esther's an incredible story. I don't know why they've never made, I know they've made a, a movie that wasn't a big production, but it's just an incredible story. This is an incredible story because this twice orphan girl saved the world. If she didn't do what she does, the Jews are exterminated. Well, look at what it says. Oh yeah, every good story always has a bad guy. I always tell people, when I remember when I was younger, they said, did you like that movie, an action movie? It had a good bad guy. It's got a good bad guy. Not that he's good, but you know, a really bad guy. Haman's a bad guy. Remember Haman? Haman wanted to exterminate the Jews. He moves the Persian king to exterminate the Jews because the Persian king doesn't know that Esther's Jewish. And so this is what it says. This is the, the context. Ex Esther, chapter 3, verse 13. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish. My goodness. In Spanish, it says exterminar. You can figure out what that, how you say that in English, to exterminate. This is an extermination. This is worse than World War II because it's going to wipe out everybody. And it says, all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, and one day even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out being hastened by the king's commandment. And the decree was given in Shushan, which is the capital, the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. Now, Mordecai is going to come to Esther. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, and then we're going to see some incredible principles. He tells her, you've got to speak up or they're exterminated. And when she says she can't speak up, this is what he says. And everybody's heard this before. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so I want to make the question personal tonight for you. I want you to think about this. And who knows whether you've been born for such a time as this? Tonight, you may be looking back on your life, and you may be saying, man, I wish I could have done something, or I wish I could have done more. But who knows if everything that happened before doesn't matter. What matters is right now. You were born where you were born, to the family you were born to, with the circumstance that you have, all the stuff that you faced in your life for such a time as this. And we need people that say, I'm going to take advantage of such a time as this. Now, what I've tried to talk about this week is crisis. As you've noticed, I've used that word a lot. And she's in a crisis. And so I want to title the message this night, to evening, How to Help Those That Are in Crisis. How to Help Those That Are in Crisis. This crisis is the physical extermination of a race. The, the crisis that we face is much larger. It's a spiritual extermination of human beings. 
And God wants us to, to learn how to help those in crisis. So let's look at three principles. First principle, chapter 4, verse 1. We're just going to continue on with what it's saying. It says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for some might enter into the king's gate clothed with, excuse me, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every, priv- every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her, then was the queen exceedingly grieved. To me, maybe the first part's the most important part, but I'll probably say the last part's the most important part when I get to it. But the first part is so important. I think the first thing is you have to sympathize with them. My biggest burden and my biggest concern for the United States is the death of compassion. Is it, excuse me for using a corny word, the death of niceness. If you read most publicly written things, whether they're on blogs or posts or there's debates, the words that people use now blow my mind. And I think it's because when you post something, you don't look at that person's face. So you just share what's in your heart at that moment. And of course, we know what the heart of man is like when Jesus isn't controlling it. And because as that word goes out, that wicked and deceitful heart, people say the meanest things I've ever heard in my life. And I can't believe it. And I understand it from people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, but I never understand it from Christians. I'll never understand that for the rest of my life. I think that we need a holy revival of compassion. Compassion for other people. Look, the people you don't agree with that they don't receive Christ, they're going to hell forever. That's an never thing. Who cares that we have a few years of uncomfort or a short season. We need to give an example of compassion to other people. You know, the Bible says, and you know this, the the Bible is incredible because it calls us pilgrims. It calls us um, strangers. It calls us aliens, right? Um, and, and, And then, so we're not of this world, as we know that. And it's interesting when you live in another country, what's the highest and most important person, highest ranking and most important person in a foreign nation. In other words, here in El Salvador, who is the most important, highest ranking Salvadorian? Or from Zambia? Or what other country? Honduras. The ambassador, right? The ambassador. Isn't it interesting that when God looks at you, that's what he calls you? He says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ, that be you reconciled to God. And so God has strategically placed you where you work, where you study, where you live, to be an ambassador. And the best ambassadors represent their nation, but have learned how to have compassion for others, how to sympathize with other people. Those are your best ambassadors. And so God wants us to be ambassadors for others. Now, notice a few things here that are necessary to sympathize with others, because I hear a lot of people tell me, I just don't feel compassion for others. I heard a young girl tell me many years ago, that had never shared her faith, and she was in the church, and we'd always talk about sharing your faith. And she says, you know, I kept waiting to feel compassion, and I never did. Finally, I went out and shared my faith because God told me to do it, and God gave me compassion as I started sharing with the person. And I think that's the problem. If you spend all your time isolated on social media, you'll never have compassion for anybody. And so look at the things that are necessary here. Number one, there needs to be consciousness of their crisis. The problem with Esther at first, she doesn't even know what's going on. She's been, she's been sequestered, you know, she's been set apart. It says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes. You know, in, in the times of, of Esther, the way people showed grief, great grief, when they were really sad about something is as if someone had died. And all of you know that what they would do is tear their clothes, they would put on sackcloth, which was like a burlap sack. You ever seen a burlap sack of potatoes? You know how that material is? It's kind of like some of the masks that you put on. You ever put on one of those masks and it's got all those fibers in your face and you're just itching your face all the time? This is worse. It's like putting on a burlap bag. And what they did is they put something on that was real uncomfortable to express what their heart felt. Understand what I'm saying? In other words, I'm grieving. I'm torn up all inside, so I'm going to put on this, 
this, this sackcloth and it's just going to be itching and horrible. I'm going to put on ashes and go through this. Now, different people grieve in different ways, right? And this is the way that Mordecai was grieving at this moment. One of the reasons we don't take advantage of divine opportunities is that we are unconscious of our surroundings. You see, at this point, she doesn't know what's going on. You may be working with a person that's going through a tough time, but if you don't ask them why, about their life, you'll, you'll never know. You need to learn to ask questions of people. You need to be conscious of what's going on in their life. I think that if people on different sides of the political spectrum would start talking to each other and asking each other, and especially Christians, and have compassion, there could be change for good. But people would rather yell and scream and isolate themselves in a room and hide behind a computer and send out venom. That doesn't solve anything. You know what? I've learned something in my life. You never change the mind of another person by attacking them. Their mind never changes. They just get madder and they get tougher. And so she doesn't know what's going on at this, at this moment. She, she just sees what's going on. And, and something that hits me about this story, and I want you to pay attention to it, is the intensity. This is an intense story. For, for example, it says that the edict that went out was not just to destroy them, it was also to kill them and also cause them to perish. And here, look at what it says. It says in verse 1, And he went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. It's so intense in everything. And you know, in their time, it was clear what it was. But I wrote, my, I wrote something in my Bible many years ago when I read this. I said, Steve, have you heard the loud and bitter cry of the condemned? Do you hear it right now? There's people crying out right now. How many of you remember the most important time in the Bible when they crowd out with a loud and bitter cry? It says the same thing. Remember that? When they were in slavery in Egypt. Do you remember that? Remember that story? It says they cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Remember, it rose up to God. When people cry out with a loud and bitter cry, it goes to God. But what did God do? Did he come down to help them? What did he do? He sent Moses. So you work with someone, and they may not put on sackcloth and ashes, but they're crying out with a loud and bitter cry, and God says, I hear you. And that's why you're there. To, to, to talk to that person. And Esther's in the perfect spot at this moment. So she, she's got to figure out what's going on. It says, And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Now what's going on in here in verse 2? He's, he's covered with sackcloth and ashes. He wants to see his adopted daughter, but he can't go in the gate. Why can't he go into the gate? Just because he has sackcloth on? We well, have to understand something about kings. Kings are a lot like your dad used to be. You know how a lot of dads don't like to hear bad news? You, you ever notice that? I don't know if your dad was that way, but you know, I don't want to hear any bad news. No bad news. That's the way kings were. That's why they had court jesters. And so if you had sackcloth and ashes, what were you going to tell the king? You can't come in. We have TV now and internet. You know, that's the way that we, don't, we, can, we can stay away from that. We want to be entertained. And it's a normal thing with human beings. So Mordecai cannot talk to her. So he comes to the gate and he can't come in. And so it says, in every province, whithersoever the king's command and his decree came, there was great, and here's another intensity, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, this is a crisis. Have you ever noticed when there's a crisis, people unite? Well, why is that? Because you realize it's what's so important. People's lives are the most important thing. And so that's the first thing. You've got to be conscious of what's going on. But the second thing is compassion. And that's pretty obvious. It says, So Esther's maids and her chambermen came and told it her. Then was the queen not grieved, exceedingly grieved. Everything about this chapter is intense. And it's interesting this phrase, exceedingly grieved. Those exact two words in Hebrew are translated this way when Saul was killed. It says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Just to make this more graphic, when it says that she was exceedingly grieved, it was as if an arrow had pierced her, pierced her heart. When was the last time that the crisis of others made you grieve that way? You know, there's one thing that Leo taught me was compassion. He was a man's man. I mean, he could beat you up in two seconds. He, he was, he was uh, when I met him, he was 49 and I was 24. And one time I was wrestling with him and just beating him up. But he fought dirty. They gave me a headbutt. The other time he did something I'm not going to repeat because I don't want to soil his testimony. But he was a man's man, tough guy. But I've never seen a person for more compassion. 
And I remember one time he quoted something to me that he'd heard from, from his pastor. He says, this is what his pastor said, that he had never seen a person not get saved when someone had wept over their soul. And I think the greatest tragedy in the modern church is dry eyes over souls. Real men don't cry at movies, but they cry over souls. Brownie. He's, he's been bugged because I said that the other day, that I was taught that real men don't cry. But what it has to do with souls, if you're not crying, you know, and I'm not trying to judge you, that's not a real man. What did Jesus do when he saw Jerusalem in crisis? Do you remember? He wept. And when Paul called the Ephesian elders, he says he wept over them all the time. And it's a compassion. And so Esther finds out they're in crisis, and it's as if an arrow went through her heart. And she had compassion at that moment. And then it says, when she heard it, she did something that wasn't too smart. It says, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Now, now one of the problems that Esther had is a problem that many of us have. Do you guys know anybody that when they're feeling down, they go to the mall and shop? Have you ever met a person like that? I'm looking at some of you, I bet. No, no. But some people, I, I know a lady, I won't say her name or anything, you would know her anyway, but when she feels down, she says, I go to the mall and I buy, a, buy clothes. And there's a lot of people that do that because by changing their outward appearance, they feel better inside. And I think because Esther doesn't understand what's going on, she just knows that there's sackcloth and ashes, that the whole nation is that way. She says, maybe if I send him some new clothes, he'll feel better. It's like Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve feel shame. They feel naked. They're hiding from God. And they say, well, let's put on some clothes. And you might say, well, it was just some fig leaves, but that was what was available to them. And so many times to solve a problem that's an eternal problem, we try to put something on the outside. And, and of course, she didn't want that. And that's the third thing, to sympathize. Um, we need comprehension. We need to understand what's going on. We need to understand what the real problem is so we can really sympathize. Compassion without discernment produces ineffective solutions. We, we, you know, we need to find out exactly what's going on. That's what happens here. It says, Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. We've got to understand what's going on here. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai into the street of the city, which is before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go into the king to make supplication unto him, because she's the ambassador, the representative, and to make request before him for the people. And so I can imagine right now Mordecai is happy. He's thinking to himself, she didn't know, she knows now. And I believe God is looking for people. I believe he's looking for someone in your workplace, someone in your school, someone in your neighborhood that has compassion for others, that sympathizes with others. Because I guarantee you there's people around us that are crying out with a loud and bitter cry to God. And he's looking for someone that's willing to go. Second Chronicles 16, 9, you know that. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Here and thou hast done foolishly, Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. That, that's part of the, the, the context. But the point is, God is looking. And I think he's looking here tonight. And he sees the crisis in your workplace, your workplace, your school, wherever you're at. And he's saying, I hope that he or she will sympathize. I hope that he or she will not be like the rest, but will be different and will have compassion. Because I've prepared these works for them, these wonderful things. And I hope that they'll be conscious of what's going on and have compassion for others. So, so, so that's the first thing. What's the second thing? The, 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 and who knows whether you've been born for such a time as this. The second thing is speak up for them. We have to speak. You know, when I first went to the mission field, before that, I can remember so many times. Now, now I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't know what church was like. And so, you know, I would always go to these potlucks. And, you know, I learned to eat food I'd never eaten before in my life. But anyway, I go to these potlucks and, um, with our Bible study, our, our, our Sunday school group. And I always remember that I would sit there in those things, and so many people would talk about 
the problems in the world and what needed to be done and things like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm a different kind of person. I would get frustrated after a while because I saw nothing's going on. Sometimes we just talk about a problem, but we don't do something about a problem. There's a moment where you've got to define yourself. There's a moment where you have to speak up. You have to do something about it. And Esther to this moment has said nothing about the fact she's Jewish. She has not spoke up about her faith. She's not said a word to them. But there's a moment where you've got to speak up. And that's why, that's why he says that she would make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And it says in verse 9, And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Some marriage, right? Supposedly he had won, she had won the, the beauty contest. She hasn't seen him for 30 days. And so you got to remember that Persian kings consider themselves to be gods. So there were two problems. They could not reverse their edicts. And of course, those of you who know the whole story of Esther know how important that is later on. We won't see that tonight. But they could not reverse their edicts because a god cannot change his mind. And secondly, they had to call for you to come forth. And of course, the picture here is unbelievable if you study chapter 5, because remember what, what does it say? You die if you come before him, unless he puts out his scepter in grace, right? And that's what does happen in chapter 5. But let's put ourselves in Esther's shoes. She's an orphan twice. She's all alone. Husband doesn't even talk to her. 30 days. And so your adopted father says, they're going to exterminate your race, and you've got to speak up. And she says, I don't know what to say. He'll kill me. I'll die. You know, I've always thought about this. If you ask people why they don't share their faith, they'll always say something that boils down to this. They're afraid. Sometimes they'll say, I don't know if I'll have the right words. They're afraid of not having the right words. Sometimes they'll say, I'll be rejected, or they'll laugh at me. But it always boils down to the same thing, I'm afraid. But she was really afraid. And I think many times in our own minds, the people we need to talk to are like the king sitting up there on the throne, and we're scared to death to talk to him. And so this is what she's saying. She's saying, I can't go before him or I'm going to die. And then Mordecai says the words that we said earlier. And they told him Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who, know whether, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? It's a time to define yourself. It says in Proverbs, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render it to every man according to his works? Think about that. You, you know, a lot of you have heard messages on Ezekiel where he talks about the blood is on your hands if you don't warn people. And I've heard people say that's only for the Old Testament. Well, read Acts 20 where Paul says, I am clean from the blood of everyone because I've declared the whole counsel of God. That, that, that's what it's saying. And, of course, if you're a believer, you're going to heaven. But we're going to stand before Jesus one day. And he's going to wonder, why didn't you warn him? You had a responsibility. You had a responsibility to tell them, to let them know. Who else is going to do it? You're an ambassador. I placed you there strategically. And I understand what she's saying. She's scared to death. She could die. But Mordecai says, you have to define yourself. It's time to define yourself. You know, for four years, we lived in Louisiana. As a matter of fact, the last hurricane that hit Ida, our house was put underwater. Of course, we weren't living there. We were living in El Salvador. And so that, that's where I met Leo Humphrey, by the way. I worked as an engineer on a chemical plant on the Mississippi River. And the culture of southern Louisiana is different than the rest of the south. It's another world. All the people live there are called Cajuns from Acadian. You know, they came from Nova Scotia. They speak French, um, uh, French English. 
And they never understood me at the plant I worked at. I never understood them. It was so funny when we talked to each other. And, but they are the funniest people with all their jokes. And they tell all these jokes about Thibodeau and Boudreaux. Because those are two common last names there, Thibodeau and Boudreaux, both in with E-A-U-X. And they tell this story that I don't think it's a true story, but it may be. But, he, but because Cajuns don't fish for sport, it's for survival. And so, one, they, you know, and, I, and, and one of them was known to fish with dynamite. I don't know if you ever fish with dynamite, but it's against the law. But it's effective. <laughs> it's very effective. If you throw dynamite into a lake, all the fish come up. It's more effective than noodling. It, it, it'll, it'll bring up the catfish. Now, I've never fished with dynamite because it's against the law. But Thibodeau fished with dynamite. And Boudreaux was a forest ranger. And he was a forest ranger there in Louisiana. And he knew Thibodeau was fishing with dynamite. And it was his cousin. And he says, you know, I'm going to catch my cousin Thibodeau red-handed. And so one day he says to Thibodeau, hey, cuz, let's go out and fish. He says, okay, let's do it. So they got a Piro. That's what they call their special, these special boats that they would put out there in the swamp. They got in their Piro. And uh, Thibodeau sat on the chair. They have a chair that's up. And underneath the chair there was a box. And Boudreau is thinking to himself, that's strange, that box there. You know, I wonder what that box is all about. So they got out in their little motor, got out into the middle of the, of the lake and the swamp. And so uh, uh, Boudreau says, we're going to fish. And Thibodeau says, let's fish, let's fish, cuz. So he quietly opens up the top of the box, pulls out a stick of dynamite, lights the fuse, and throws in a lake. Boom! And all these fish come up. Boudreau's speechless. I can't believe you're doing this to me. I'm a forest ranger. How in the world could you fish in front of me like me? I'm taking you to jail. Well, Thibodeau didn't say a word. This is what they say. Didn't say a word. He just calmly opened the box, took out another stick of dynamite, lit the fuse, and gave it to his cousin. <laughs> then he looked at his cousin as the fuse was going down and says, we going to talk or are we going to fish? <laughs> and so I think that's what Mordecai is saying to Esther. We're going to talk or are we going to fish? I'm just, I'm just one of those people I get tired of here listening to people talk about how they're going to change the world. Because the changer's God, and we can do it tomorrow. But some people will talk the rest of their life about these great projects they have. And they'll just tell you all about how they have a burden for these children, or we have a burden for these poor people, they have the burden for this group. And sometimes I want to say in a loving way, are we going to talk or are we going to fish? You know what I'm talking about? Does anyone understand what I'm saying about that? And maybe none of you are that way. I love this church because I know you guys are doing ministry. But that's what Mordecai is saying. Look, Esther, I love the part where he says, if you don't do anything, God's going to do it anyway. Genesis 12, we know that, right? He's going to keep Israel okay. But he says, you could be destroyed. You need to do something. You know, and I thought about this. Poor girl. Twice orphan. She's all alone. And her dad says, adopted dad, your race will be exterminated. But then I thought, poor Esther. We're in a worse situation because there's an edict against every human being. And I can give you two verses. You know Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is the soul that sin shall surely. Two edicts, and both are irrevocable. Do we agree with that? You cannot revoke those two edicts. It's the same as the other edict. In this case, the edict is the Jews will be exterminated. That's an edict that cannot be revoked. Another one is if a person sins, they will die spiritually. And so Jesus came to take away that edict. It, it, this is my favorite verse, maybe second favorite verse in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6.20 is my favorite. Colossians 2.14, talking about Jesus. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, the edict, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus Christ said, the only way I can solve this problem is to become a man. And he was God. God became a man. And he took the form of that innocent little baby. And I can't even think of the equivalent of that. Somebody says the equivalent is, imagine yourself becoming a sea slug and living in the sea. But imagine not just living in the sea temporarily, for eternity. You ever thought about that? Jesus changed eternally. Before, he was, in, in the Old Testament, he's always existed, but in the Old Testament, remember who he was? The angel of the Lord. But he says, I'm changing forever. 
I'm taking on human form. I'm going to live forever with scars. This is forever. And he did it for you because there was an edict. There was a whole law. There was a whole list of, of, of sins that were against you. I love 2 Corinthians 5.21 that says, He that knew no sin was made sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God. And I always tell people in El Salvador it's like this. This is Steve Kern. This is his list of things against him. This is Jesus. There's nothing. And on the cross, he did an incredible thing. He did this. Jesus became sin for us, that, for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. He took that edict away. I can hear those nails that went through his hands that were nailing every edict against me. Did I deserve it? No, but Jesus took away an irrevocable edict. And his plan is for you and me to speak up, just to speak up. That's all that we have to do. And that's what he says to Esther. you got to speak up. you got to say something. It, Paul was afraid to speak. You know, if you're afraid to speak up, you're in great company. You, you really are. A lot of people always say to me in El Salvador, what do I do if I'm afraid to talk? I says, that's good. When you're not, you're going to depend on your flesh. Because when you're afraid, it says that when they were afraid in Acts, that they prayed and the place trembled. And then they had boldness to speak the word of God. You do, do an interesting study on your own. Every time they're filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, every time, one time they spoke in tongues and people just groove on that. But every single time that they were filled with the Spirit, you know what it says they did? They spoke the word of God. There's only one thing that overcomes your fear. Only one thing. One thing, being filled with the Spirit, being controlled by God. And so when you're afraid to speak, that's a good thing. You're like Peter. You're like Paul. But then you've got to say, God... Fill me with your spirit so I can do incredible things. Paul was afraid. It says, J Jesus says, he spake, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So last point. Who knows whether you have been born for such a time as this. This is the most important part. This is incredible. I'm going to say it again. This is incredible. This is incredible. This is a twice Orphan, 15-year-old girl who changes the world for one reason, because she did the last thing. Let me read what it says. I hope you never forget these words. It says in verse 15, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. And I try to vision. Think of a girl you know that's 15 or 16 years old. And this is what she says. Oh, this is a holy boldness. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also, my maidens, will fast likewise, and so will I go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. The devil cannot do anything with a person willing to die for others. He runs, he flees. It's unbelievable. This little girl said, if I perish, I perish. And she changed the world because she was willing to do the last thing, to sacrifice for them. You know, I shared with you the other night that our discipleship, we start off follower, servant, but we really believe if we want to change the world that the last step is sacrifice. And I quoted this verse. Uh, oh, I wanted to say this verse. Remember this. A faith that risks nothing accomplishes nothing. You know, when we moved to El Salvador, and, and I don't say any of this for you to think anything about me because I didn't know, I had no clues what I was doing. It was like what Jose was saying. He says, our church is growing and I have no idea why. And of course, what he meant to say, I'm not doing anything secret, God's just doing it. But when, I moved, when we moved to El Salvador, we were in the middle of a civil war. And in the middle of the civil war, it was a war where the communist girls were trying to take over the country. And we moved there at the halfway point in 1985. And when we moved there, everyone in my family literally thought I was crazy. They wouldn't even talk to me. It was like if someone has a crazy uncle in their family and he comes and everyone avoids him, that was me. Don't talk to Steve. He's weird. He used to be a chemical engineer. He's making a lot of money, and he went to El Salvador. He gave it all up. He's just kind of a strange guy. Don't get him upset. He's kind of weird. And so no one would talk to me or anything. And all I had in my mind was that God had called me. It made no sense, but I knew he'd called me. And so we were living there for a few years, and in 1989, right after the Berlin Wall came down, 
was the final offensive in El Salvador. It was a movement by the communist guerrillas to try to take over the country. And um, Nelson remembers it real well. I don't know how well Chief and Jose remember it. Do you guys remember the final offensive? How old were you guys? I was 10 years old. 10? Okay, you guys remember then. And so in the final offensive, you have to realize what was happening in the world. It was 1989. Berlin Wall had gone down. And the writing was on the wall. The communist guerrillas knew they would not take over the country. They had to do a last desperate effort. And so what they did is they infiltrated every one of the key neighborhoods in the country. And they came in by first stockpiling weapons in houses. They were called safe houses. And they also, that night, they were going to take over the country. They brought in uh, free parties, weddings, all kinds of things that would be huge trucks coming in that made sense. And they stockpiled it with guerrillas. The guerrillas were already there. I remember because we were in the eastern part of the country in San Miguel, and we were having a campaign that night. And I remember when we preached, there was all these weird-looking guys with backpacks on. It was really strange. And so that night, we went back to our house, and I was with Julio. Julio was a youth pastor at Miramonte. Many of you know who Jeff Adams is. He was the pastor there before. Um, he was the pastor I went to work with, and then he came back to the States. I'm, he probably knew I was weird, too. You know? he, no, he answered a call. He answered a call. And so, anyway, I moved down there, and, and we're, it's 1989, and uh, Julio comes to the house, and he says, Steve, I, I took the van. He was taking the kids back to church Sunday morning and Saturday. He says, I was going to take the kids back tomorrow morning, and um, I couldn't do it because they were fighting over by the, 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 the Tercera Brigada, the, the, the third brigade, which is San Miguel. I thought, well, they're doing that all the time. And so he left the van with us. And about one hour later, I went to bed, and it was incredible. I learned what every weapon sounds like because an AK-47 M16 Galil, which is an Israeli rifle for snipers, and a, G, and a G3 all sound different. And so you're listening to all this, and it's like watching a war movie, but you don't know who's winning. Well, the worst part was outside my room where I was sleeping, there was a sniper. And this is the way his weapon sounded. Bing! Bing! And I hear that all night. And so here was the worst part about it. You know, sometimes you got to have a sense of humor. I'm sitting there in my bed all night, and I have to preach the next morning. I says, I hope these guys finish. And then after a while, I says, i got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and then I said, about an hour later, i really got to go to the bathroom. Well, what was the problem? You've got to walk across an open field to go to the bathroom. And so this is the honest truth. I said, God, I'm going to die going to the bathroom, but I've got to go. <laughs> Because I would rather risk my life than have a mistake, because this was all night. So I get out of my bed, and I'm walking, and they're shooting off, um, how do you say bengalas de luz? Flares, flares. So they're shooting off flares, and this is what you would hear. I come out, and I hear, because it was like daytime. And then it would hit the ground, and silence. And so when it got dark, I ran to the bathroom. <laughs> And I have a testimony to tell you I made it. I'm here today, you know. And so, anyway, and so this goes on all night. All night they're fighting. And I kept, and then it was the morning. And so the guy named Omar was there. And I said, Omar, this has gone on pretty long, has he? He says, yeah, we've never had an offensive this long. It went on all day. It went on the next day. We were there for six days trapped. So make a long story short, after six days, the worst part was one of the days someone came to the door and says, open the door, Omar Claros, open the door. And he says, hide Steve, hide Steve. And, and you know, Salvadorians have a weird sense of humor. Because when I tell this story, they crack up. Americans never laugh. But they say, we tried to hide under, Emmanuel Steve under the bed, but his legs were too long. <laughs> you guys have heard that before. And I says, I'm sorry, it's a genetic problem. And so anyway, so they're fighting and they're fighting. And this guy says, open the door. He says, okay, okay. He says, we need your van. And there was two soldiers there that were bleeding all over the place. And that freaked us out. We had to get out of there. Well, we found out the Red Cross couldn't come into our neighborhood because they'd mined the entrance. And so finally, Julio showed up. Julio, you always hear about Julio. He was here five years ago. He shows up with a white flag with another pastor. And he says, you guys got to get out of here. The guerrillas have taken the whole area. And if they see Steve... They're gonna, they thought I was an East German first because mercenaries were fighting be, because of my, the way I looked to them was like a German because there was no Americans there. And so I got out of there and we walked out with a flag. And it was so funny because I was staying with two families there and, and, and one of the ladies says, Hermano Steve, don't say anything. 
okay, don't say okay, don't say anything. So <laughs> we walk out with this flag. I feel like Gulliver, you know, this tall guy walking out. And we look back, and the whole thing's just blown up and bullets everywhere. Get back to the other side of the city. Next morning, the jets come in and strafe the whole area, just blowing everything up. So I got out. We get back to my house. I could never talk to my wife. This is, there's no cell phones. All the phones are down. I get back to the house, and I found out the whole offensive started in my neighborhood. My wife was there playing with the kids. It says, everybody in. Los muchachos vienen. Muchachos is what they call the gorillas. They go into the house. My wife spent the whole night underneath the stairs because there's cement. There's a cement. You know, when the helicopters fly over, a stir of bullet will not go through cement. So you always look for cement. She spent the whole night with our kids under there. Get back, and we're talking all about it. The only problem was it wasn't over. That night, I'm back at home. They started fighting at night. And now, if you've ever been in war, you know that at night they fight with tracers. So you can see where the bullets are going. And so we had these urban tanks in their neighborhood, and then we saw the helicopters coming in, and the gorillas had escaped. That's when they escaped from the Sheraton. They were running near our house, and I am sitting in my bed. I'm not exaggerating. I'm sitting in my bed with my wife next to me and three kids and a kid from Soyapango, Salvador Herrera. He was at our house too. I'm looking out there, and I watch. It is so bizarre. They were blowing up the posts, and I would see the flash first, and then I would feel then I would hear it blow up. And I'm sitting there, and my kids are sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, you really are crazy, Steve. You're an idiot. Your whole family was right. You brought your whole family to die here. You know, it's one thing if you die yourself, but your family? I just had little kids. This is when my kids were six, four, and two years old. But then God spoke to me. And he says, a faith that risks nothing accomplishes nothing. And it just gave me a peace. It just gave me this incredible peace at that moment. And of course, now we're there. And I'm always amazed at people like Esther. If I perish, I perish. Well, one last thing because we're, we're out of time. But she says something really strange here. And I know that you guys like to study every word in the Bible. But it says in um, verse 16, it says, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me. And you know, how many books of the Bible never mention God? Yeah, very good, too. Most people say one. He knows. Song of Solomon and what? Esther. Esther. But God's all over it, isn't he? Because why would they fast? You never fast in the Bible unless you're praying. And here's my takeaway. Many times in your life, it's like Esther. It doesn't seem like God's there, but he's behind the scenes. That's what's happening here. And, and she says to fast for how many days? Now, come on, three days? That is not a coincidence. That is not. It, historically, we, we know that it says in um, Hosea, come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. A lot of people think the idea of Jesus rising on the third day was a totally new thing. It was already in Hosea, the idea. So maybe she said three days because she knew. Um, uh, maybe she was thinking that way. You know, I'm not sure she knew Hosea, but maybe that's what she was thinking at that point. I, I'm not totally sure of that. But I do know what it was saying doctrinally. And this is what I want to finish up with. This whole week, everything we've said, don't remember anything I've said, please, but this. When Paul talked about what his goal was in life. Do you remember what he said? That I may know him. And what else? His sufferings. And what else? The power of his resurrection. And this is what I want to know the rest of my life. The rest of my life. I'm 62. And I'm trying to think about what am I going to do the rest of my life. I'm, trying, I'm starting to figure stuff out. So I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do now? I'm starting to figure things out. What am I going to do the rest of my life? I want to know one thing, the power of his resurrection. Because it's an incredible thing. Think about it. If China, the United States, Russia hated my guts, we hate Steve so much, we're going to take every thermonuclear weapon and put it and bomb him and just obliterate him. It doesn't matter because Jesus says, bing, resurrection. There is no greater power in this universe than the power of the resurrection. Whatever is coming against you right now is a joke. 
My dad used to always say diddly squat. Do they say that anymore? Diddly squat. That's just, I'm teaching these guys some English. Diddly squat. <laughs> diddly squat means nothing. It's diddly squat. But the power of the resurrection, that's an incredible thing. And so now it makes sense why Paul prayed this prayer, and I finished the whole conference, and this is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for you. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. It's a holy calling, right? We've been talking about that. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the power to us who do believe? Does it say that? What is the power? No. We don't want diddly squat, right? Say no to diddly squat. <laughs> to the great power. Great power? No. The exceeding, what is that called? You tell me what that was when it's a triple, triple whammy. It's not whammy, but yeah, but he, this guy's an, this guy's an expert with languages. Just superlative? Oh, that's boring. Okay, that's what he said. It's a triple superlative. <laughs> triple superlative. Okay. The, the, he, Nelson and Julio are masters of languages. They, they always get into arguments about certain words and everything, and so it's fun to learn. But it's a triple superlative. It's exceeding greatness of his power. To who? The ones who have faith. So what have I said all week? The only thing you need is faith. Don't tell me you're not eloquent. Don't tell me you're not intelligent. Don't tell me you came from a rotten family. Don't tell me that you're sick. Don't tell me what you're facing. It doesn't matter. Excuse me if I sound rough, but it doesn't matter. What matters is if you believe, right? Faith. Now look at this. This is unbelievable. According to the working of his mighty power, what power? Not just any old power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Woo! And set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Here comes Esther. No one will give five cents for her. She's 15 years old. She's been orphaned two times. She probably doesn't have a seminary degree. She probably never been through discipleship. She doesn't know anything, but she's willing to die, and that changes the world. That's what unlocks faith. You see, a faith that risks nothing doesn't accomplish anything. And God is looking for a holy generation of believers that believe God. Amen. Well, they might laugh at me. you got to die. They might reject me. you got to die. It's not in my plans to do this. you got to die. And that's my invitation, to die. You know, I love those old movies when I was a kid of the gladiators and Spartacus but they never could overthrow the Roman Empire. Only one group could. A bunch of nobodies. We don't know their names. Just nobody Christians. Nobodies. We don't know their names. They get up every morning and they would say, Lord, I look forward to dying for you in the Colosseum. And they brought the Roman Empire. Described in Daniel 2 as a beast. They brought that beast to its knees. And Emperor Constantine, and I'm not saying he was a believer, but he Christianized the nation because those nobodies, without physical weapons, without Facebook, without any social media, without any technology, got up every morning and believed God could change the world, and they were willing to die for it. Are we willing to die? I mean, that's it. That's how we're going to reach San Pedro Sula, Bogota. Guatemala City, Blue Springs, Zambia, San Salvador, every one of these places. Who knows? Who knows? You know, who knows whether you've been born for such a time as this? I guess I would say I do know. We live in the greatest time in history because it's the greatest time to be willing to die to ourselves and say, God, I believe you. I'm a nobody, I'm nothing, but you're incredible. You can do great things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Because he gave us the example. He died on the cross for our sins. And the, and the cross couldn't hold him. The tomb couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him. And that same power is available to us. And I thank you for that. And my prayer for my own life and for everybody else's life is that we would know the exceeding greatness of your resurrection power. And Lord, we know that we're not much in this world, but we believe you're something. You're incredible, Lord. And I pray that you would overcome our shortcomings and help our faith to grow, Lord. Use First Bible Baptist to reach Blue Springs in the greater Kansas City area 
and to continue sending out missionaries. And Lord, I thank you so much for this church that loves us so much, loves you, and for what they're doing. And I pray that you would use us throughout the world, Lord. Lord, I pray for the workers as you asked us to do. The harvest is white. We need more workers, Lord. I pray that you would raise up a new generation of people that are willing to die to themselves so that others can know the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to hear the loud and bitter cry. Help us to feel compassion for those that don't know you, Lord. Help us to see them as you see them, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And with